Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are very glad you're listening today and we have a very special show today. Now, we're coming to you by tape, so don't try to call in. Normally, we are a call-in radio show, uh, but just sit back and listen because I promise you something. You're going to get a truckload of things you never knew before today. How's that for a lead-in? We have special guest, uh, Dr. Angel Helms, who is in the Department of Entomology. She is Assistant Professor of Entomology. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me today. I, I'm excited about that. Of all the topics, you know, we go through different things where we're excited about this or that or the other that you're learning. Uh, right now, this is in the big middle of, of what just amazes me. And we're going we're gonna to get to amazing here in just a minute. Uh, uh, Dr. Helms, I, uh, I always like to ask guests, you know, what got them into this? You know, why would someone, why would you specifically want to be an entomologist? Or why would you want to learn about the uh, specific area of entomology you're working in? Well, to be honest, I was a little bit hesitant to get into entomology. Mm -hmm. uh, I came into entomology because that was where the, the lab was that mm -hmm. accepted me for graduate school. And okay. I was a, little, a bit hesitant about working with the insects initially. Yeah. But what really drew me in to entomology was through this field of chemical ecology, which mm -hmm. is uh, what my lab studies here at Texas A&M. And through chemical ecology, I came into that because as an undergraduate student, when I was in California, I was working in a lab that studied physiological ecology or hydraulics or how water was moving through these woody shrubs in this mm -hmm. very arid environment. And that was pretty interesting. But what I was really interested in was why the plants there had so many different aromas or mm -hmm. smells and why were they producing these different smells? And so after talking to my undergraduate advisor, he said, well, you know, a lot of these are for the plant's defense. I thought, what defense from what? Like, yeah. what are they? What are they worried about? Yeah. And uh, so, it turns out they're very worried about insects and a lot of other things. And so uh, that drew me into this area of trying to figure go. out what's happening. Well, uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, chemical warfare now uh, in the garden. Now, if, uh, if you're an organic gardener, just hold on, l hear me out here. Uh, but there are things going on in the gardens that are beyond us. It's not, I've talked about this on the radio before, but it, it's not just us and, and the plants and we have to make everything happen. There's nutrients in the soil. We don't have to always fertilize everything to make it stay alive and grow. And when it comes to pest control, uh, most of the pest control out there is done for you by a lot of beneficial insects. And we're not going to talk beneficials today, but you know about ladybugs and lacewings and other things. Uh, it, if you knew what an aphid have, has to go through to grow up, uh, it, it's amazing that any aphid ever makes it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, today we're going to talk about a different angle. And when I say chemical warfare, of course, I'm kind of joking, but not too much because this area that you're interested in, a chemical ecology, would you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, of course. So our research area of chemical ecology is we're very interested in the ecological interaction, so how different organisms are interacting with each other. And specifically, how does chemistry play a role in these interactions? So how do defensive toxins in the uh, that are produced by those organisms drive these different interactions? Okay. And when, when you say toxins and things like that, uh, what is one of the basic ways that... Uh, that that kind of in, would get that that would get into the environment and that would make a difference. Why do we even care? <laughs> Why do we care? Yeah. yeah so plants are, are are not really just helpless in the process uh, of growing and providing food for us or providing our beautiful landscape, mm -hmm. right? So pl plants have this incredible ability to defend themselves against herbivores. So okay. herbivore things that are going to chomp things them that up. are going to eat them, yeah. like the caterpillars and the aphids and uh, plants are able to produce these different toxic compounds in their tissues. Mm -hmm. So they are much better chemists than we are. So a lot of our inspiration for different um, 
insecticides even, mm-hmm. for example, they come yes. from plants. From plants. And things that those plants are naturally making. Yeah, so if you don't spray your plants with insecticides, the, the plants spray themselves with insecticides <laughs> or they produce them. I've heard that around the feeding they site. They make their own. There's some pretty toxic chemicals that are produced. And, Absolutely. And But then there are some that go off as a volatile into the air. And let's talk about that. Yeah, so that is a really fascinating area uh, of research and something that I'm sure a lot of the gardeners who listen to the show are actually familiar with are plant-produced smells. Mm -hmm. So if you like cooking, for example, and you Mm -hmm. grow a lot of herbs in your garden, why do we like to grow those herbs? Because they smell fantastic. Uh, Another thing is most of us are familiar with that smell of fresh cut grass right after you mow the lawn. Right. Uh, uh, Some people really like that smell. Uh Uh, Well, Actually, it it serves a really important ecological function. So when you're smelling that fresh cut grass smell, that's actually the plants screaming Oh my gosh. or emitting this odor because they're trying to defend themselves. They think that that lawnmower that came through is a giant caterpillar that just chopped off all those blades. All right. Well, my apologies to, uh, to all the listeners now. Instead of sitting and enjoying that fresh cut grass smell, you're going to imagine billions of tiny grass blades screaming at you. <laughs> <laughs> but that that is cool. So so these uh, volatiles that go out in the air, they do communicate. And let's mm-hmm. how about an example? Like uh, give me an example of a plant and some pest and what might go on because of the interaction that you and your lab are working with. Absolutely. So basically any plant that you can think of. So let's use a tomato as an example. Okay. So a lot of us love to grow tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, a tomato, when it's being fed on by those big green hornworm caterpillars mm-hmm. that you might have found in your garden, the tomato plant produces this characteristic aroma. Mm-hmm. So as the caterpillar's chomping up that leaf, the leaf starts to smell. Mm-hmm. And the reason that it's producing this smell is partially to repel other herbivores from coming in mm-hmm. and also has a very important role of recruiting in beneficial insects oh, or wow. these what we call natural enemies mm-hmm. so like those predatory bugs um, or especially these parasitoid wasps okay and those parasitoid wasps will then come and kill the caterpillar for the plant and they act like bodyguards in yeah. that sense and so that's <laughs> communication between the plant and this uh, that, parasitoid that that is just amazing that that's going on out there. Uh, a few years ago, I was in San Antonio at the Botanical Garden, and we had a group from the Midwest visiting. And uh, we walked around the corner, and there was a Texas mountain laurel on the corner of the building. And that has this grape Kool-Aid smell that yeah. just is gaudy, syrupy. And their noses popped up in the air, and they, they looked, and, and they went toward that plant. And that's kind of what you're saying. <laughs> that, yeah. Like a Something that would attack the hornworm is flying around, and it gets that smell, and it goes, oh, there's food down on mm-hmm. this plant. That, yeah, so the plant can knew? provide a good location <laughs> cue in that sense. Yeah. Um, another thing that uh, uh, plants can do is they can provide a food reward. So some different plants have a, like a nectar that they produce, and, and we, we're familiar with that for, for pollinators, for uh-huh. example. But they can also uh, recruit in their wasps because they need something to eat as well. And so they'll they'll be attracted to the, the nectar or extra floral nectar. Yeah, outside that, that's of the... what I thought they were just feeding the wasp. I didn't think about that the plant is using that to get the good guys to hang mm-hmm. around. Or yep. what it thinks is a good Absolutely. guy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, what wow. it thinks is a good guy. <laughs> that, that is amazing. Uh, so uh, you used, uh, we were visiting uh, before uh, the show today, and you used the term recruiting bodyguards. And I think that's a good analogy. So this plant is basically saying, hey, uh, a tomato hornworm is feeding on me. And so it sends the signal that that particular pest's natural enemy smells, if I can anthropomorphize, Mm -hmm. and come to it. But it's not just a signal that attracts all insects. So if a different insect came and fed on the plant, a beetle, let's say, or a different caterpillar, different species, Mm -hmm. tell us about that. Right. So that's a really good point is that uh, the production of these aromas or these, uh, Mm -hmm. I guess, signals that that are being produced to recruit in these natural enemies, they're very specific to the insect pest that's feeding on a leaf. And the plant can actually recognize the identity of its attacker and produce a different blend of compounds to recruit a different bodyguard, (laughs) depending on who's, who's actually there and feeding. And how does it recognize the identity of its attacker? 
I mean, plants don't have eyes and go, yeah. oh, that's clearly a hornworm. Through the spit. <laughs> Through the spit. <laughs> Through the spit, yeah. So insects uh, have saliva mm -hmm. <laughs> and a regurgitant that they produce uh, while they're feeding, and they spit and they slobber all over the leaf while they're chewing it up. Uh, and, and the plant can recognize the flavor <laughs> wow. of the spit, yeah. So it, it senses the saliva or the regurgitated material on mm -hmm. the leaf and it, it says, oh, that happens to be a such and such. Exactly. So I'm going to release the specific smell to get a different, uh, I, I don't know. I. <laughs> it's really hard to, I told hard you to this, imagine. I told you guys, this is mind blowing. It's pretty cool stuff. And we're going to, we're going to stay on it. If you, if you're listening today, just know that we're coming to you by tape. It's not a call-in show as we usually are. It's a tape show. Uh, but I know you're going to want to tell your friends about this so they can go online or go on the podcast and hear this show because uh, I'm learning a lot today and I, I sure hope you are too. Uh, so, so the plant is able to communicate with the bodyguards that it needs for that particular pest uh, because it can sense the difference between the pests. What are some other kind of things that you're looking at in the lab uh, that, that you're studying or, yeah? Yeah, of course. So the, the volatile compounds from that uh, plant that we just talked about mm -hmm. or that are so important in recruiting bodyguards, they have a lot of different functions. So they're not just recruiting in bodyguards, but uh, plants are using those chemical cues to communicate with each other. And so we can, actually, this is an example of eavesdropping. And that's something that I, I think is just so fascinating, that organisms are not only uh, able to respond to these chemical cues that are produced just for them, but they are also eavesdropping on each other. And so plants do this. So when a, a plant is being attacked by a caterpillar or an aphid and it produces those volatile compounds to try to recruit in bodyguards, a neighboring plant that doesn't have any caterpillars on it can eavesdrop in on that smell and prepare its own defenses. So that, that plant will say, OK, well, if my neighbor's getting attacked now and that caterpillar's still hungry, he might come over and start feeding on me. So I need to get my defenses ready. So what kind of defenses? What, would that, what might that plant do to get ready? Yeah. So this is a, a, a pretty cool process where the plant doesn't start producing the defensive toxins until after an insect comes over and starts feeding. Instead, they just, um, and we don't really understand the mechanisms of mm -hmm. how it works, but somehow the plant is able to recognize and start making changes um, to its uh I guess, physiology yeah. to get ready for the attack. And then okay. it responds by producing more defensive compounds okay. once an herbivore starts to feed. So it's it's kind of like getting a uh, vaccine. Uh, that Absolutely. You, when the thing shows up, you, you're ready to go. You exactly, have, you yeah. Have built up a little bit of a natural. Mm -hmm. And there. we call it priming. So priming. it's sort of like how we prime our immune system, mm -hmm. exactly like you said. That is, that is cool stuff. Wow. <laughs> well, and it gets more interesting. Uh, and more interesting. <laughs> and I guess, you know, you as a researcher, uh, it, you just have to live in a world of wonder where somebody else is discovering some new thing and some other thing that can happen. Tell us a little bit about underground. Yeah. So that's another area that our, our lab is studying that uh, we're, I got really interested in when I was doing a postdoc at Penn State. And this is what's happening below the soil surface. So mm -hmm. this is an area that's still relatively underexplored because we just can't see what's happening. And the same... I think it's all underexplored. It's I mean, all underexplored. We've scratched the surface, I bet. Yeah. And so below ground, we see a lot of these analogous processes. So a lot of things that are very similar to what happens above ground, they happen in the soil too. So there are insects that feed on your roots, mm -hmm. right? So many of the listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with... Um, like Let's a grub see, or the a grubs, wire worm or wire something worms, like that. Yeah. Or like the sweet potato weevils yeah. and all kinds of things that are attacking mm -hmm. their precious uh, plants below ground. Well, that's a, a, an area that we're also studying is how do the roots of the plant respond? And it turns out they also produce these volatile compounds. And they are also recruiting bodyguards, except the bodyguards are different in this okay. case. So the bodyguards below ground are nematodes. Beneficial nematodes. But they're beneficial nematodes. Yeah, yeah nematodes kind of get a bad rap, I yeah. think, yeah. right? Yeah. Most people are familiar with the parasitic yes. nematodes. Yes. Well, these these uh, beneficial nematodes, they're insect killers. Mm -hmm. And the, the nematodes are attracted to the smell of roots, 
Mm -hmm. uh, once they're being uh, damaged, kind of like the wasps are above ground. And they're crawling through the soil and they're sniffing around and looking for insect prey. And when they find an insect, they will crawl inside the body. Mm -hmm. So they go inside through the mouth Mm -hmm. or through the spiracles, spiracles yeah, how they uh breathe. And then once they get inside the body, they will regurgitate or defecate a bacteria. By by the way, I knew we were going here, and I know it's the lunch hour. (laughs) Hang with us. This is worth it. Hang with us. Yes, (laughs) I I know. It's it's really pretty disturbing, but also very fascinating. (laughs) Well, if you, if you don't like the pest, it's a it, you enjoy watching what's about to happen. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So then, once they get inside and they produce, this, uh, they release this bacteria, and then they work together. It's a team effort with the bacteria and the nematodes, and they kill this insect. And it happens pretty quickly. And then the nematodes reproduce and they feed inside of the insect, consume the whole thing until it's gone, and then they burst forth. <laughs> and uh, all of these little nematodes come crawling out and going through the soil, and then looking for more prey. So like a balloon full of spaghetti pops and they're <laughs> yeah. just, it's pretty much lethal like that. spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, lethal yeah. spaghetti. Wow. And the plant said, hey, I need some help from you. Now, mm-hmm. there's also some ways that the beneficial nematodes, uh, they produce some chemicals that tell the plant some things too, right? Yeah, that's a, a really fascinating thing. And it's something that our lab has recently started studying is how do plants, so we know that they can recruit the nematodes to mm-hmm. come in and help them kill insects, mm-hmm. but can they actually recognize whether the nematodes are there? Mm-hmm. And so uh, nematodes are producing chemical pheromones and uh, a, v- a variety of different things that, that we're trying to figure out what they are. And the plants seem to be able to tap into that and, and actually recognize, hey, my bodyguard is here. Mm. And then the, ch- the plant changes its defense responses. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> There's a lot of talking going on in that quiet peaceful morning stroll through the garden that that we're, we just never knew was was happening. So many behind the scenes things. Wow, that's cool. Well, let's let's talk I want to take it one more one more step. So, we've got a caterpillar feeding on a leaf and the plant recognizes and knows which caterpillar and release, releases the right volatile to bring in the right beneficial insect to attack the caterpillar. There's changes going on in the plant, but one of the things you just mentioned was the volatiles from this plant go to the next plant through the air, and that plant says, oh, this is going on. I need to get ready. But there's something that happens underground, too. And will you, will you tell us about that? Yeah. I think what, I think what you're talking about is uh, how plants can be connected. Connected, yes. Below ground. Yes. Yeah. So plants form associations uh, with beneficial fungi. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the really common ones that uh, some people might be familiar with are mm-hmm. mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae. And you can mm-hmm. even inoculate your plants with these. You can buy yes. cultures of mycorrhizae mm-hmm. and um, add them to your garden to help help your plants to take up nutrients. Yeah, and a huge percentage of all the plants we have studied so far have that mycorrhizal yeah, uh, it's uh, mutual benefit. Mm-hmm. So many, many plant species form associations with mycorrhizae. And the, the fungi, they grow in the soil and they actually form networks so they can connect plants with each other. Wow. So uh, one plant can be connected to another plant through this little network of fungi. And the signals of, of defense responses can also be transmitted through the fungi. This is a was something pretty mind-blowing that, that was discovered a few years ago. Wow. Uh, I guess the analogy back in the days when we had phones with wires in our homes, <laughs> yeah. it'd be like you picking up the phone and it goes through the, the lines, the, the mycorrhiza, and somebody else answers on the other end. And and so, th- so they can communicate and say, what, I'm being fed on by an insect here? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I think uh, one of the studies I'm thinking of had aphids feeding on a plant, that, and then that plant was connected underground through these fungi to another plant. And the, the connected plant that didn't have any aphids on it uh, got exposed to the signals, the defensive signals from its neighbor, and upregulated its defenses. So it increased its, its defenses to prevent the aphids from coming over. Wow. So two ways the, that it communicates from one to the other. I, I just would think this has got to be a <laughs> this had to be one of the most exciting areas of science to be part of now because we really are getting in on the ground floor of an, a whole new whole new world, aren't we? Yeah. That that is cool. Um, tell us a little bit about the the beneficial um, nematodes uh, that are there, 
and uh, it, are they just in our soil already? Uh, do, you, can, do you buy them and put them on? Uh, and what kinds of nematodes are we dealing with? Yeah, so the, the beneficial nematodes, they can be in the soil already. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, what is it? There's, there's some statistics about just a, a little ounce of soil contains yes. how many millions of, yes. of <laughs> organisms, yeah, and, and a lot of them are nematodes. And miles of fungal strands. And, uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So we, we definitely find beneficial nematodes in our soils, okay. but uh, we use them for biological control, and we call this augmentative biological control. Mm -hmm. So you can buy packages of nematodes. You can order these on the internet. It. It's kind of wild. Um, millions and millions of nematodes and uh, apply them to your garden. So you're buying a living thing. Yep. A living thing. And how do, how do they come? How do, you know, what, how there's, do you get a living nematode to somebody and they get it on their yeah. soil or plant? There's a few different ways. That sometimes they come in sort of a powdery matrix and mm -hmm. sometimes they come in a gel and sometimes they come in a, in a little sponge package. Okay. Um, and uh, you... So they'll come very concentrated in this mm -hmm. little package. And then you have to, I guess, on the package, they call it activate them, which means put them in water. <laughs> okay. So you, you uh, and there'll be instructions on the package about, about how many to apply to a certain area. Because um, like I said, they're sold by the millions. And yes. um, they're very tiny. They kind of, you can, you can actually see nematodes with the naked eye mm -hmm. in water. Uh, they kind of look like thread, like yeah. little white pieces of thread in the water. Um, you won't see them as soon as you put them in the soil, though. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll disappear very quickly. Yeah. And and uh, you can put them into a watering can and apply them to your yard, or put them into a, a sprayer. Okay. Now they're they are a living organism. So just think of an earthworm, which is quite different from a nematode. But if you put an earthworm on a dry, hot sidewalk, it's not going to last long. And so we need to make sure the soil's moist or any other things in making yeah. successful <laughs> applications. That's a really great point. Is uh, nematodes, although they're excellent at killing insects, they are a bit fragile. Mm -hmm. So they are very susceptible to the UV light. So you definitely wouldn't want to apply them at midday. Mm -hmm. And they're susceptible to extreme heat and from drying out. Okay. And so you really would want to optimize your conditions of when you'd want to apply them probably earlier in the day or later in the evening yeah. and have a moist, a nice moist soil, keep mm -hmm. it nice and moist. And then um, another thing is there are different many different species of these insect killing nematodes. And some of them are actually a lot more tolerant of Texas conditions than others are. Really? Yeah. Why do we, how do we discover that? Yeah, so it, uh, the websites that sell the nematodes will have that information, mm -hmm. but there are there's one species that we like to work with here down in Texas that we've, we've been working with in a garden trial, and that's called Steinernema rio brave. Rio Brave. Yeah, and you can probably imagine Rio, where it was yeah. discovered, right? Down in the valley. Yeah. yeah, so these were discovered down in the Rio Grande Valley, and so they can they can take the Texas heat. That's amazing. Wow, that that is pretty cool stuff. So when you put these nematodes out and and you water them in, uh, and they go down in the ground, and you talked about getting inside the insect, do they live for a while down there, or do you always have to keep reapplying them? Yeah. So the they can live, I'd say, probably about a week or so okay. in nature. It kind of depends on how um, like stressful the conditions yeah. are and how quickly they find a host. Okay. So one thing that's really great is if you do have kind of a low-level uh, infestation problem, or even if you have a, a pretty decent infestation, if they infect an insect, they will produce more nematodes for you. By them. By themselves. Multiple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. many, many fold, right? Yeah. So um, I think about let's say one white grub. If you mm -hmm. infect a, a white grub, you'll probably get at least 50, 100,000 nematodes will come out of that one single grub. Oh, what a wonderful thing to happen to a grub. So yeah. uh, 50 to 100,000 when the grub explodes and, and, they, and just, they, come they out. just go everywhere. Yep. And so then that's Man. a whole new generation that's going to crawl through and um, yeah. protect your plants. Yeah, it sounds like you need to keep a little um, population over on the side. Whenever you find a white grub, throw it into a, a container full of full soil of and, yeah. and nematodes and just keep making you more nematodes. Keep making more, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Well, that is pretty pretty amazing stuff. Uh, so the, the plants sense these th these uh, communications. Oh, and you mentioned Steiner nema. Uh, there is also another common one, and I, I remember years ago, uh, reading about uh, flea larvae, the larvae that live out in the thatch in the lawn and stuff, if you have mm -hmm. dogs out there, 
uh, at that stage, they're very nematode susceptible. And I think it was Steiner nema or is heterobditis is the other one? Yeah, the other one is heterobditis. Yeah. And we love working with a particular um, species of heterobditis. It's heterobditis bacteriophora. Okay, you, so, need to, you need to pull up to the radio and listen because you're going to like what's coming next. Yes. So we love working with this particular species because it turns the insects maroon when they die. <laughs> <laughs> so the grubs will turn a beautiful shade of eggy maroon. Wow, that's yeah. cool. So, <laughs> so anyway, you like I obviously you like them for that. The the different kinds of nematodes. I sus are they all Steiner nema or heterobditis? There's other things out there probably. Um, uh, those are the two, actually. Oh, yeah, the there two. are only two genera. Okay, so are there species that attack different? kinds of pests specifically? Or are they more generalist? Or am I getting too off in the woods um, there? Most of them are pretty general, yeah. Okay. So so you'll you'll find this information also on a website if you're trying to order the nematodes okay. that, that certain species um, might be more suitable for certain pests. Okay. But most of them are pretty general. But I guess there's one other kind of cool fun fact about okay. nematodes that I can provide. So nematodes have different hunting strategies. So we don't really think of, of worms as being hunters, right? But okay. but nematodes, they hunt uh, d based on different strategies. So okay. we have ambush killers. So okay. they will um, find a good location and then they'll sit and wait until their prey okay. comes okay. by. Okay, and we're talking about something that's like, what, a sixteenth of an inch long or something? <laughs> yes. And yeah. it finds a good location. So yeah. it's not like it crawls seven feet through the soil to go somewhere. No, uh, so, we're working on a much smaller scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So finding it a good location kind of cracks me up. Yeah. For <laughs> but whatever a good location yeah. means yeah. in this little tiny. <laughs> okay. For this little tiny guy, yeah. So they will uh, stake out. A, a location, maybe it's by a plant, for, okay. for example, okay. um, and and then they'll wait for the the prey to come by, and then mm -hmm. they'll sense, okay, the cues of my prey are there, so there's maybe carbon dioxide that they're breathing, or or some smell that's the being given off. The nematodes are smelling too. Oh yeah, they smell. Yeah. Okay. And, and so then uh, if the prey comes by, then they'll attack. They're okay. like ambush killers, we call them. All right. But then there's also what we call cruisers. <laughs> So cruisers, <laughs> they move through the soil. So those, these are the active hunters. So these are like mm -hmm. the little lions that are yeah. prowling through the soil <laughs> looking for prey. All right. <laughs> oh, you know, you go out and sit in your garden, uh, those of you listening to the show, and, and you just sit there and it's quiet. And isn't it amazing what's happening? There are a multitude of, I'll call them smells that you don't smell, that are communicating with plants and insects and plants communicating with plants. And uh, it, it's just an underground, all this stuff. There's a nematode hiding or found a good location, <laughs> a deer blind to sit and wait in. Um, I, it's just amazing. You know, you look at your garden in a whole different way, don't you? Yeah, that, absolutely. That is cool. So Steiner Nina and Hepatitis. Now, from a home garden standpoint, uh, are these pretty available, or is it mostly kind of commercial producers, or is it? Actually, I think probably the home gardener is one of the biggest markets right now. Okay. Yeah, and so they're available from many different outlets. You can uh, even, oh. or yeah, you can order them on the internet okay. if you just type "beneficial nematodes," <laughs> yeah. you will find them, and. Um, yeah. There are yeah, very good instructions for how to use them. Um, actually, use in agricultural systems or on a commercial scale has been a lot slower. Okay. And that's kind of one of the main motivations for our research and working in this area is mm -hmm. trying to figure out, well, what's the issue? Yeah. Like, why, why can't we use them more effectively? And, mm -hmm. and is, it, um, is there a way that we can find additional benefits of using nematodes that might mm -hmm. make them more appealing okay. on a commercial scale? That's cool. I. I wonder, I'm thinking out loud here, but uh, would it be, would we see a day where we dip our plant roots in a nematode drench, a beneficial <laughs> nematode before we plant them, and then we know, you know, that solution you made yeah. with all the nematodes, it, you know you'd be introducing them right there to the roots. Yeah, that's a really great point. So uh, one of the projects that we're working on is using, not not dipping them in before, but we're mm -hmm. applying the nematodes early on in the season at, a, at the seedling stage. As a drench? As a drench, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're applying them directly right on the plant roots. So we're not okay. spraying them out in a, in a broad area. We're applying them in a very localized um, part of the plant. And the reason that we're doing that is for the biological control, so to kill any of those early season mm -hmm. pests that are in the soil trying to eat the those tender little seedling roots, but we're also trying to stimulate the plants um, or to get them to produce defense responses um, 
because they appear, uh, based on our research, to, to recognize the, the nematodes are there. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not so far off, I think, uh, based no, on what we're, what really we're trying to achieve. It's, it's really, really not. Uh, by the way, uh, you're listening to Garden Success today, and we're coming to you by tape. So while we're normally a call-in show, don't call in today. Just sit back and enjoy. And if you're just jumping in late here, you're going to want to go back and hear this whole thing. You can you can go listen to it on a podcast, or you can listen to it on the KAMU-FM website where we post the past shows. But we're visiting with Dr. Angel Helms, uh, Assistant Professor of Entomology, and our topic today basically is chemical warfare, all the things going on out in the garden uh, that uh, we weren't even aware of as plants defend themselves, as they warn other plants, as they recruit uh, natural enemies of the pests that are attacking them, uh, lots of, of really, really cool stuff. Uh, there's another thing that uh, you had told me about uh, that is that plants can sense vibrations. Tell us about that whole world. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this really interesting um, finding that came out of a few years ago that plants not only are smelling each other, mm -hmm. they can also sense vibrations. And, and these vibrations are specifically coming from caterpillars chewing on leaves. And so we wouldn't think that there's much sound involved, Yeah. Um, that it's such a quiet little process, right? Mm -hmm. But caterpillars have these really nice hard mandibles, so that's their mouth yes. parts, mm -hmm. and they're biting and biting and chewing up leaves. And so... Um, Creating a tiny, minuscule little vibration. Little vibrations, yeah. And so plants can actually uh, pick up on that. And is that a, another thing of identifying something that's going on? Yeah, I think there's some some specificity to it because wow. plants can ha uh, uh, sorry the the caterpillars can have different um, sort of rhythms of right. how they're chewing or different <laughs> um, different intensities of the sounds and yeah it was it was found that plants eavesdrop on the on the chewing sounds even that, so that it's is. kind of there's just really no limit to to these findings it's it's just so unbelievable yeah. you can't make it up no you can't it's really cool stuff. Uh, some of you who are gardeners and have tomatoes have run into the tomato hornworm. Uh, that's when you go out and one whole section of your tomato plant doesn't have a leaf on it. And you look and look and you don't see any pests. And then finally, you see that little guy sitting there uh, with the little horn sticking out of the Hopefully back Hopefully still little. <laughs> Hopefully still little, yeah. Uh, yeah. If there's a lot of leaves gone, he won't be probably. Tomato and tobacco hornworms. Uh, and have you ever seen one with white, little white uh, oval elongated globs uh, all over the, the the pest, or maybe there's a few, or maybe they're really all over them. Well, that is a particular wasp, and I would like uh, you, uh, Angel, if you would tell us a little bit about what goes on that wasp. So, so the plant has already said, the tomato has already put out smells to bring in an enemy, and tell us about the one that we've visually have seen in our gardens. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so those tomato hornworms uh, mm -hmm. or tobacco hornworms, they're attacked by this Cotija wasp. And, and mm -hmm. like you mentioned, the, the tomato plants produce smells just like mm -hmm. all these other plants do to recruit those wasps in. And when the wasp finds that caterpillar, it'll lay a bunch of eggs inside it. So it has a, a stinger or an ovipositor, mm -hmm. um, and it lays a bunch of eggs inside. And then the, the little wasps, um, they'll hatch out of those eggs and they'll feed as larvae inside the caterpillar. And they will, the caterpillar though stays alive through this whole process. And the, the wasps will eat sort of all the non-vital yeah. <laughs> organs inside. So just while, while you folks are listening, I, I just want you to close your eyes a minute and get in touch with your inner caterpillar. I know this is the lunch hour. Imagine worms crawling through your abdomen <laughs> and feeding on your inside. Now, if you hate tomato hornworms, that's got to be the most exciting news you've ever heard. But that is so gruesome. It is incredibly gruesome. It's horribly gruesome. It's horribly, horribly gruesome. And then it gets even worse. You can't <laughs> even imagine. So then once they've actually uh, depleted this, this caterpillar uh, and they're ready to, what we say, pupate, mm -hmm. so they're ready to go and, and become adult wasps, mm -hmm. uh, they will crawl back out through the skin of the caterpillar on its back, and then they'll spin those cocoons. So those little white globs that mm -hmm. you mentioned, those are little silk cocoons. And inside of each one of those little cocoons is a, a wasp transforming into an adult. An adult, wow. 
And uh, when we do our master gardener classes, we have a section where we talk about beneficial insects. And I actually have a picture. And it's interesting, the end of that tall little cocoon opens up like a little trap door. Yeah. And, and the wasp comes crawling out. Yeah. So think about this. You see a tomato hornworm, and your first uh, instinct is to pull it off and step on it. Uh, and, you know, it's that took care of it. But if it has these white globs on it, we shouldn't. Because no. you just said that it stays alive, but I'm thinking it doesn't want to eat a whole lot at no, that stage. No, exactly. Yeah, it and, doesn't It doesn't do a whole lot. It's just, uh, at that point, incubating wasps yeah. for you. So let it raise a dozen of these, and the next time a tomato hornworm comes by, there's probably a wasp flying by listening to your screaming tomato plant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned something that uh, when insects lay eggs in another insect, a beneficial like that, that it's not just putting a larva, an egg that'll hatch into a larva, but there's something else going on. Tell us about yeah, that. Yes. So, so some of these wasps, mm -hmm. they also have a, a virus that they inject. At the same time as laying their eggs, they'll inject this virus into the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And then that caterpillar will, uh, sorry, the, will have an, a suppressed immune system. So the virus will suppress the immune system of the caterpillar so and allow- So it's not the, able to fight the larva. It can't fight the wasps then. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly. just, that's not fair. Not fair. <laughs> but uh, but it can do something else that we it, talked about, right? Well, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so there's a whole other level to this. So the um, it just kind of is a non-ending uh, non -ending chain of who's trying to eat who in this world, right? Yeah, you know, and let me just say, I know where you're going. Uh, we think of our gardens like, I have an aphid, there's a lady beetle, problem solved. But that's like a food chain of one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> tell, us, tell us about what you're about to... Yeah, so so we have this other uh, phenomenon, and the the technical term for it is intra guild predation. Intra so, guild, oh intra -guild. guild, I boy, that's a highfalutin word for insects. It is but, right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know insects had guilds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we love to categorize things into okay. into what we call guilds. So what that that is fancy talk for just saying basically these are predators that eat other predators. <laughs> now that just spoiled the fun. I was uh -huh. I was gonna go out and hug my cotija wasps uh, and thank them for all the work they do, but what's happening to them? Right. So we also have hyperparasitoids. Okay. <laughs> and so these hyperparasitoids are out on the hunt looking for other parasitoids, and so they can identify a caterpillar that has wasps inside of it, and they'll hunt that caterpillar down, and then they can. Um, lay their eggs inside the wasps that are inside of the caterpillar. How do, how do, they, how do they find that, that what would tell them there's a hornworm, just like the tomato screams and it puts out this scent and uh -huh. the hornworms say, or the wasps say there's a hornworm there. Yeah. How does the second level parasite It parasite also play? happens through volatile compounds. So the, uh, the when the caterpillar has this parasitoid inside of it, it changes the profile or the flavor of its spit. And so then it changes how the plant responds to that spit, which makes it give off a different odor blend that then attracts these other these other parasitoids. A parasitized tomato hornworm changes its spit, and now the tomato is putting out a different volatile? A different, yeah, a different blend. Makes so mm -hmm. The tomato needs. To, we need to tell the tomatoes this. Uh, to stop this is it. not helping them no. at all. Okay. So, and the piper parasitoid comes in. Oh wow, that is. <laughs> I told you guys that you were going to learn a lot of stuff today that you've never heard before, and I, I certainly have. This is this is so fun. I just love this. Yeah, but I really like what you said too about um, don't necessarily squish every insect you yes. find in your garden. Yes. Yeah, and when, when we do our organic gardening class with the master gardeners, one of the things we try to convince them is a few pests is a good thing. Because for most people, you know, you go to the grocery store and you're buying spinach and there's one hole in a leaf and, you know, that's not okay. If it was in your <laughs> garden, you would want to spray it because something ate it. Uh, and the same thing with green beans. Uh, I saw a study years ago that you can pull 40% of the leaves off a green bean bush before you appreciably affect its production. Mm -hmm. So you can put up with some damage. It's okay. But there's there's the other reason I think you're we're alluding to that uh, a few aphids is a good thing because if you just have aphids, boy, can they ever reproduce. I mean, one yeah. aphid becomes, you know, knee-deep oatmeal in the garden of aphids. But 
uh, if you have a few, then the lady beetle coming by wants to lay eggs there, and the, the lacewing, and the uh, surfid fly larva, and the, there's a cool little wasp that oviposits in aphids, too. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's something, if, if the gardeners haven't, uh, who are listening today haven't seen these before, um, take a look at your plants, especially um, a good place where I've always found them is on sweet peas in the spring. Sweet peas, okay. Yeah, so if you're growing like sugar snap peas mm-hmm. or something, uh, and and these will often get aph- pea aphids on them, mm-hmm. and they're pretty big, so you can mm-hmm. see them, uh, you'll find that some of the aphids don't look quite right. Right. They look glossy and mm-hmm. kind of... Um, Opaque. Like they were aired up with about 20 pounds too much pressure? Yeah, exactly. They look kind of inflated mm-hmm. and just not not really right. Well, we call these mummies. Mm. So these are the aphids that have parasitoid wasps inside of them. Mm-hmm. And the, the name for those are mummies. Mummies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what happens after that? Yeah, after the wasp develops inside of that aphid and inside of that mummy, and it will it will come out, and then you'll have more wasps that are attacking your aphid population. It eats a little circle hole, too, yeah. out of the top back end of the aphid and yeah. comes crawling out. And so if you have a hand lens, even 10 power, you can see these aphids. Uh, so if your aphids are like pink, aph- some are pink, some are green, some are uh, yellow, like on the... Uh, Uh, tropical milkweed or Mexican milkweed, uh, and you know what the normal aphid looks like, and then you see some that look like maybe a sesame seed color, paper sack brown, pecan brown, some even darker. Mm -hmm. Uh, They know that every one of those has a wasp inside. So uh, So leave them, definitely. Yeah, leave them. And even if you're an organic gardener, uh, insecticidal soap is about the least toxic thing that we put out in our garden. So we take baths in soap. <laughs> but when you put it on an aphid body, it does a lot of physical damage to the surface of that aphid. And so if you did that and you kill these aphids early on that had your friend growing inside, you would actually be working against yourself by jumping to it. So. Yeah, and I think um, one thing I've noticed here in in my endeavors in gardening in Mm -hmm. Texas is we do have some pretty healthy natural enemy populations. So there's a really good community of these beneficial insects uh, that'll come to your garden very quickly. They'll show up very fast once you have some aphids. It's amazing how they find that. Yeah, Through smell. (laughs) Is it smell? Yeah. A lot of it is through smell, yeah. So do you know, is that a, is that, is the plant screaming or is the aphid just giving off an odor or how on earth would these wasps uh, so both, actually, okay. in the in the case of aphids, it's really a, a quite a fun interaction. The aphids produce what we call an alarm pheromone. So um, it's this, com- <laughs> yeah, they release this compound when they're stressed out or nervous or scared. Um, that's that's this pheromone that's signaling to the other aphids that they're under attack. Is that the little drop that comes out of the tailpipes? It can be, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> out of the right. tailpipes, I like well, that. That's <laughs> yeah. a, when you look at an aphid, one way to tell them is on the back end, they've got two tailpipes coming out yep. like a hot rod. Exactly, yep. And um, and wasps are attracted to that smell. Okay. They say, oh, there's my lunch. I'm definitely going in there. Yeah. That is that is cool. <laughs> but of course, the, the plants are doing a really good job of right. signaling too. They produce a lot of that um, attractive perfume yes. to lure in yes. wasps. And just to kind of go back to even the beginning of our talk, if you take your fingernail and pinch off a piece of leaf, the plant doesn't scream, it doesn't produce that volatile. Uh, it it, it, do, it produces some, but not the same. Yeah, the exactly. Same. Yeah. So some of the volatiles are, are released just because of that mechanical wounding. So like, that's why- Like you, mowing the lawn. Yeah, like mowing the lawn. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. So what we're talking about is a few aphids is a good thing, and aphids are just an example of something that applies in many other situations. Because when you have a few, then you have all the natural enemies. And uh, one of the things I often tell gardeners is if you have that little tropical milkweed and it gets that yellow aphid that absolutely covers it up, that aphid doesn't really bother the tropical milkweed that much. But boy, does it bring in a lot of beneficial insects, the ones I've just named well ago. Uh, and so let's say you have tropical milkweed next to your rose bush that doesn't get that same aphid, gets a different aphid, or a crepe myrtle that gets a different aphid, or a tomato plant that gets a different aphid than the tropical milkweed. You're raising, uh, it's a nursery for lady beetles, lacewings, parasitoid wasps, surfid flies, and so on, that are then going to be flying around your plants and helping you out. So you're sort of you're augmenting there with plants instead of bringing the beneficial in Exactly. Itself. And you mentioned something really interesting, I think, about the tropical milkweed example. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people will grow tropical milkweed because they want to feed the monarchs, right? Okay. They want to feed yes. monarch 
uh, caterpillars and they want to bring in the butterflies. Um, One really interesting area that we're studying also in plant insect interactions is how plants respond specifically to whatever pest is on them. And plants have very different defense responses to aphids Uh than they do to caterpillars, like the monarchs. And so some people might be very worried if they see that there are a lot of aphids on their milkweed that, oh, no, my monarchs aren't going to like that plant. Actually, (laughs) monarchs really will like that plant because uh, there's this kind of um, crosstalk that's happening inside the plant with the defenses. And so if the plant is sort of, we could say, distracted by the aphids and, and trying to defend against the aphids, it um, will not respond as strongly to the monarchs. And so the monarchs will do better on a, on a milkweed plant that has aphids. And they're all already a little bit, um, it's not as toxic to them as it would be to some other insects, the, the alkaloids in yeah. the milkweed. Yeah, exactly. So milkweeds uh, produce very toxic compounds. So mm-hmm. they're they're toxic to almost almost every organism except these these very select few mm-hmm. that are able able to tolerate that toxin, which mm-hmm. one of which is the aphids can can tolerate it, but uh, monarchs as well. So they can mm-hmm. both detoxify some of that com- some of those compounds mm-hmm. and they also sequester them or steal them from the plant. Okay. And so while the monarch caterpillar is feeding on a leaf, Okay. It will encounter these defensive compounds, and then it will um, incorporate them into its own body for defense. The, oh, man. I, I read an article a while back, and uh, I was thinking I may have had it with me. But it was it, the title of it was A, a nup- Nuptial Gift, <laughs> and that when the eggs are laid uh-huh. from the, from the, um, uh, to- the, the, the caterpillar that has the, the the toxic things becomes a butterfly, and it, it, when they mate, some of the there are things that are transferred that affect the success of the egg. I think, and and uh, it's also part of that uh, alkaloid kind of process. I don't know. It, yeah, it, it just it was just amazing to me that this was going. It on. is pretty amazing. I'll, on a future show, I'll I think I'll get that article out and read more about that. That's that's fun. Wow. So you're saying also don't get rid of your uh, pests or insect infested with pests because they are also that nursery that, yeah. that helps out. OK. Now, there there's another thing that uh, I just you had mentioned and I've never heard this one before. But tell us a little bit about bumblebees that go to a flower and maybe the plants just doesn't have enough flowers to to make it happy and give it enough nourishment. Yeah. So. Uh, we were talking a little about um, like what's what I find so exciting still mm-hmm. ab- about research in this area. And one of the things is I just can't wrap my mind around is every few years there will be this this new discovery about some some new thing in nature that's been going on yeah. just without our, without us realizing it. Mm-hmm. And one of those things that, that was just published a couple of years ago was a study about bumblebees. And in the case when bumblebees don't have enough to eat, mm-hmm. They will trigger plants to flower earlier and to provide them with food. And so in this study, they found that bumblebees had this really bizarre behavior. They were using their mouth parts to, instead of um, what they usually have, like this tongue, Mm -hmm. to... um, drink the nectar, mm-hmm. right? But they also will have little mandibles. So they have mm-hmm. they can they can kind of bite. And so they were biting holes in leaves. Mm-hmm. And the researchers noticed, okay, they, they look like these little sort of tr- um, triangular shaped holes mm-hmm. in leaves. What are those bees doing? Are they eating the leaf tissue? Mm-hmm. No, actually what they were doing is they were um, triggering the plant to produce flowers so that they would have uh, floral resources. And the plant produced flowers more and flowers earlier. And earlier, because yeah. Because bumblebees bit the leaf and said, hey, you can do better than this. I need, I need some more feed pollen us, and Feed us, please. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> that, that's just amazing. I, I, I would just love to say, okay, tell, me, <laughs> tell us more of the, the new things that you've read recently or that you've, you know, you've seen or some of the research going on. Uh, uh, you can tell us a little bit more about the research going on in, in the lab. That would be interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, so another area of research uh, that, we, that we've been looking at, so we're really interested in this plant-to-plant communication and especially how plants respond to the volatiles that are produced mm-hmm. by other plants. And I had an undergraduate student in my, in my lab, Laura Marmalejo, and mm-hmm. um, she just graduated this past spring, and she had a research study that uh, was so interesting. She found that squash plants that are fed on by these salt marsh caterpillars 
So do, are you familiar with the salt marsh caterpillars? Are these big, kind hairy of ones? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're they're generalists, so they'll eat almost any plant. So okay. we, we also were uh, just kind of playing in the lab, and we tried feeding them leaves from anything that we could find outside. They'll eat it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were excited in working with them because they'll feed on squash, and it's not easy to actually find many different things that will feed on uh, plants in this family because they're fairly toxic. But um, the the squash plants that have these salt marsh caterpillars feeding on the leaves, they produce characteristic volatile compounds, these these odor blends, and other squash plants then become more susceptible. So they actually suppress the defenses through this volatile communication um, th- from the salt marsh caterpillars. And so then if that salt marsh caterpillar moves to the neighboring plant that was mm-hmm. exposed to those odors, yeah. It will do better. It'll uh, grow bigger. It'll eat more leaf tissue, and the plant will have reduced defenses. And so this is um, what we think is an example of sabotage, yeah. that the caterpillar is is manipulating something to its own uh-huh. benefit. And it is totally the opposite of what we thought was going to happen. So you can imagine I made Laura repeat this experiment a couple of times <laughs> just to make sure. I said, no, that doesn't happen. We can't possibly see a suppression of defenses. But Wow. But yeah, so... Well, that that's that's amazing. So now instead of the squash screaming for help, uh, the caterpillar is saying, there's nothing to see here. Everybody yeah. move along, move along, mm-hmm. and so that it can go to the next one. And, exactly, and it, yeah. It just is weaker. Wow, that is yeah. cool. Yeah, and so, so sometimes it's just really hard to predict the direction that these interactions uh, take. And I think that's a really good point, too, since you, you mentioned that this is chemical warfare, right? So it's not one-sided. Yeah, no. That's, so it's, that's interesting. It's not just that the plants are able to produce these toxins to try to uh, protect themselves from their insect attackers. The insects also have many different strategies for overcoming plant defenses. And so it could be that they um, produce effectors or these compounds that suppress defenses, like in the case of these salt marsh caterpillars that okay. we were studying. Or sometimes they clip off a leaf or girdle the, the section of the leaf so, uh-huh. um, so that the plant can't produce defenses in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that, that's a whole nother world. Uh, amazing. Uh, anything else going on in, in the research world of, of your uh, chemical ecology and, and uh, this whole kind of thing that might be of interest? And uh, up- Yeah. So another, another area is I have a, another graduate student, Morgan Thompson. She's studying um, the coexistence history of, in, of insect pests with plants. So we have, uh, in, specifically, she's working in the squash family. So with squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, and melons. And we have uh, squash and pumpkins, you know, were domesticated here from North America. Mm-hmm. And so they have coexisted much longer with certain insect pests compared to um, other species like watermelons and cucumbers that were domesticated in uh, Asia and in Africa. And she's studying how plants respond to those pests based on how long they've coexisted with each other. Okay. So do they have a tolerance? So can they can mm-hmm. they tolerate the pest better and still go on to produce fruits? Or do they induce this, these uh, volatile compounds to, to bring in beneficials to um, help them fight off the attacker? So like, what is their strategy? And does it have yeah. anything to do with how long they've interacted with a particular pest? And I would think that being around a long time probably makes them a little better at dealing with the, that's our the, prediction with the yeah. Local. yeah yeah that's our prediction is that yeah. based on how long they've interacted uh, yeah. with with a particular pest will will yeah. really affect how they how they perform well you know when a, some of the worst pests that we have are those that come from somewhere else to here and they don't have the natural enemies and fire ants is a big big example oh, you yeah. know back in I think the 50s they landed in the Gulf Coast and moved in and uh, in recent years, a lot of the research has looked at things like the forehead fly that's uh, <laughs> down in the native area. Uh, and uh, okay, here's another fun fun uh, fact uh, that's gruesome about <laughs> insects. We're on a roll today. Uh, but the forehead fly lays an egg right behind the fire ant's head, and the larva chews, and the head falls off. Yeah. Uh, that would be alarming to me if I were one of his friends down yeah, in the ground. Yeah, so know. they call him decapitating What happened to flies, Joey, yeah. man? <laughs> he yeah. lost his head. So. One of the effects of them doing that, it, not only are we killing fire ants, but fire ants don't want to go outside when the Ford flies are flying around because it doesn't end well. And so mm-hmm. the actual harm that they might cause us is, is somewhat reduced from that. I just 
That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's actually a really great point, and that's another area that we um, that of research in in plant insect interactions is that doesn't only happen with um, with insects. Uh, like fire ants, but also there are caterpillars that get scared when they notice that their their predators are around, and so it can prevent them from coming out to feed. And is this a is this a volatile thing that? Are, yeah, are, it can be from the pheromones of the predators, for example. So this has been really wow. well studied in Colorado potato beetle. Okay. Like apparently, Colorado potato beetles, even though they're pretty uh, voracious yeah, pests, they they're also very fearful, <laughs> and so they're very fearful of their predators. So one of them is the spine soldier bug. Um, oh yeah. And and they yeah. can smell the pheromone of that of that spine soldier bug, and they'll hide <laughs> and stop I bet, feeding. I bet somebody's trying to come up with a pesticide that all it is is just a smell of spine soldier bug that you spray on your on your uh, Colorado. Absolutely, they are. Yeah, there's researchers yeah. up at Cornell that are doing this work. That yeah, is, that is just amazing. You know, talking about all the wonders of plants, I was just reading an article, and this isn't entomological, but uh, they are they have seen a response in a certain plant. Uh, root system to sound and they would grow toward sound so like the sound of something it would actually make the root go in that way oh, that's just that amazing. is so fascinating well hey i you know i could do this for another five hours uh, but <laughs> we're gonna have to go we've been talking to dr angel helms thank you so much for coming today and by the way i want to congratulate you on your dean's outstanding early career Research Award. I think that's well-deserved. Look forward to other things coming from your lab and you. Thank you so much. All right. It's great to have you. Thank you for listening to Garden Success. Uh, we are a live show normally, but occasionally, gosh, we just get the opportunity to talk to a really wonderful guest like today. Uh, so next time you go out in the garden, you might look at things a little differently and pause to stop and observe and learn. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. 